Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to our session today. Uh, Vivi and I are going to be really excited to be um, sharing with you uh, the um, uh, preliminary results mm -hmm. uh, from this um, CARL OCLC survey that we conducted at the end of last year. And we wanted to um, uh, start by, um, I wanted to start by sharing um, some information about um, OCLC because I find that even though OCLC is pretty well known, some people don't know, for example, that we're a, a member um, governed organization. Uh, there's over 18,000 member libraries worldwide. Um, so I think a lot of people think of us as being very much a US-based organization. Um, and we are, but we also have significant representation from elsewhere in the globe. And we're also um, a member-driven cooperative. We have a Global Council and then the OCLC Board of Trustees who very much uh, guide our work. And I'm going to be talking about the role of Global Council in particular uh, in, in, re in relationship to this survey. Um, I work for OCLC Research, uh, which is a really um, large organization. I think that in the division of membership and research, there's about um, 60 of us. So that's a pretty substantial investment that OCLC makes in uh, research and to uh, public purpose um, efforts such as this survey. And I think that that really <coughs> distinguishes us from uh, other um, organizations that are uh, of a similar composition to OCLC's that we dedicate so much uh, resource to, um, to research. And uh, so I was talking about the um, the importance of our uh, of our governance structure and the um, regional councils uh, in this effort, we were gently encouraged by the um, European, uh, Middle East, uh, and Africa regional council to consider sharpening our intelligence uh, for research library needs uh, outside of the United States. And that was a really um, a polite way of telling us that uh, OCLC research tends to be kind of, uh, most of our work um, tends to be US first, and then we replicate that work in other regions. Um, and this was the first time, to my knowledge, that we have started some work uh, external to the United States, and, um, and then uh, uh, kind of uh, looked, at, looked at what we could do um, elsewhere. So we launched um, this survey that was uh, really looking at what are the priorities for research library directors, um, at, uh, in, in Europe, and then uh, we uh, went on from that to partner with uh, Carl and Call, the, um, the, uh, the Australians, thank you, <laughs> um, the Consortium of Australia University Libraries, um, uh, to, do, to repeat the survey uh, in, um, in 2018. And this has been really um, an opportunity for OCLC research to look at the work that we do and how it can be um, contextualized or indeed where we should launch new efforts uh, to support um, other, other regions of the world instead of being uh, so U.S. focused. So I'm, I'm going to jump in here now and of course I, I'm very uh, pleased to introduce Carl to you all. And Carl, of course, is the, um, is the group that is the voice for the research libraries in Canada, so, so the 29 of the, uh, the largest research libraries in Canada, plus our two federal libraries, so there's the National Science Library uh, and Library and Archives Canada. And as you can imagine, Carl spends an awful lot of time talking about how we can add value. So where can we add value in areas that are important to our community um, without necessarily duplicating the work of others, without duplicating the good work happening in our local institutions. Um, and so uh, when we look at our, our strategic plan uh, broadly defined, we're focusing on very broad themes. We're focusing on advancing research. So that, of course, is um, open access and research data management. We're focusing on the human dimension, the workforce, and by that we frame it as strengthening capacity. And we focus on the assessment and the evaluation of our work, and we frame that um, <coughs> under measuring impact. And finally, we frame out the important work we do around influencing public policy. 
And you kind of imagine that those in some ways are might seem like similar themes to, for example, an organization like ARL, uh, but we of course are doing it with a, a distinctive Canadian flavor. So in 2018, when we were approached by OCLC, we were in that critical moment that many of us that are involved in large research library organizations are. We were thinking about renewing our strategic plan. And so like uh, many organizations, we struck a strategic planning committee and ours was actually led by Jonathan, um, who is right over there in the second row. So welcome to Jonathan. And the strategic planning group, of which I was a member, uh, utilized many of the tools that you could imagine. Uh, so we of course did an environmental scan of the work, the strategic work of our other sister um, organizations. Uh, we looked at our past plan. What had we accomplished and what was still sitting on the table? Uh, we did an online survey of our members. We met with each of our members on the phone individually. We did a, um, a pretty significant workshop. Um, and then we were approached by OCLC. And so for us, this was a great moment. And in thinking about it, the reason we were enticed uh, was with the idea of having a third party, a neutral and, and uh, valued third party to come in and help us look at, at the data and to possibly ask questions in a different way than we were thinking of asking them ourselves. And I should also note um, for um, our colleagues here in the room that, that Carl has a very strong international focus. Uh, we have increasingly close connections with ARL, with um, LIBER, with RLUK. We're a founding member of IARLA. Uh, we are very actively involved in IFLA. So this um, international focus is something that, that comes very naturally to us. In fact, every uh, two to four years, a contingent of CARL directors heads off to a different part of the world to try and learn from, it, from our colleagues in, in some other place and to share the work of Carl with them. And by coincidence, uh, the area that we're heading off, close to half of the Carl directors are heading off to June, in June, to Australia and New Zealand. So the concept of having um, a replication of a survey that was also being done in Australia was exceptionally enticing to us. So then you might ask, um, who are all of these Carl directors that we approached with this survey? And, I could tell you that they're probably the most talented and fascinating people in our profession, and some of whom are actually in this room. Um, but I think it's probably more important for me to tell you that we're a relatively new group of people. Um, some of you ha might recall the excellent <coughs> work that um, Stanley Wilder did uh, a few months ago. It was reported in the ARL um, RLI publication, where he looked at the demographics of, um, of the profession and he identified some distinctions between Canadian and, and, and U.S. directors in particular and he said that um, uh, you know we tend to be a little bit younger there's a far fewer of us that are that are over the age of 65 and I think the important piece from this slide is that there is a large proportion of us that have been in our role for less than five years so so that's the group that we ask the question to Um, and so for this survey, as, as Mary Lee was suggesting, we asked library directors to really share with us their top of mind um, observations about the use of the library uh, by both faculty and by students. And we asked uh, them to focus not only on the here and now, like what's happening right now in 2018, but also what do they envision will be the reality five years um, later in the year 2023. So that again is the framework. And on this very first slide we see that the library directors expect a change in the visits to the physical library to increase somewhat modestly, while the use of the online library, access to collections and services that can be used without actually visiting the physical library uh, will expand over the next five years with 44% of us suggesting that the increase will be upwards of 20%, which is actually quite significant. I think I'm going to turn yeah. it over to Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to just uh, kind of switch back and forth here. Um, um, I'm providing my viewpoint as kind of that, that neutral third party, 
and Vivian has the, the Carl and library, uh, uh, Carl and library director um, perspective, so she'll be pitching in with, with her observations over time. So as Vivian said, we asked um, about uh, faculty and about student use. So here's how our library uh, directors um, see uh, or faculty and staff coming into the library today. Um, as you can see, mostly to uh, mostly a collections-based view. And I think that um, what's interesting here is uh, the look at the future. Um, so here the slide is uh, it's reordered by, um, uh, well, I'm not sure how it's reordered, but in any case, it's reordered. Um, and you can see that uh, there's, there's a pretty significant jump in, uh, we're expecting uh, faculty and staff to be utilizing the library uh, more for research support services. Um, there's a big jump in library as technology center from 14% to 41%, um, and also a jump in utilization of the library as social space or a meeting in social space. And I think that echoes some of the um, trends and discussions that we see here at CNI and have been hearing for some time is uh, the pivot from uh, collections to services and spaces. Um, anything more to say about this particular slide? You no, think? only in, we'll see it again when we get to the students, but the implications are really around physical space, around staffing, and perhaps more importantly, around our campus relationships. When you start heading into the area of the library as technology center, it's a, it's a dramatic focus uh, change from physical collections. Yeah. So we're going to shift gears from uh, faculty to students. Um, students, uh, we can see now, uh, library directors see them mostly as coming into the library for spaces and also um, collections. And I should emphasize here that, uh, that in, in, the, in these sets of slides, we ask people to pick the top five. So it's not like things on this slide are not, in, if they don't, if they uh, aren't reflected in terms of the percentages, it's not like they aren't important, they just didn't rank in that top five. And that's something that I want to repeat over and over again, is that if things, uh, are, fall low on the list. It's not that they're not important. They don't collectively reach that, um, that, that top five. So that's something important to keep in mind about the survey overall. Um, so here's the five-year forward picture, which again is quite interesting. Um, as with faculty, we see students coming into the library uh, for Technology Center. And also really interesting to me um, is receiving research support services. Um, so this is something new where we haven't uh, traditionally um, thought of students as being recipients of research support services. And this is a theme that we'll, we'll come back to again later in the presentation when we look at um, UK and uh, Australia and New Zealand um, results. So, so keep this, uh, hold, hold this in mind. Um, anything, and, and again, we see that uh, use of the library as space um, individual and collaborative space uh, holding holding very strong in our future as well. Any more to say there? Okay. Um, so then we asked, uh, what are your top five priorities, and which areas would you categorize as most challenging or ripe for innovation? Um, and this most challenging and ripe for innovation area is where. Um, where OC, is really, uh, this is where OCLC would like to be focusing, is what are the areas that are most challenging and ripe for innovation, because we think of these as categories that could be uh, areas for collective action, um, which is where we like to think about focusing our effort and attention. Um, and again, this was, uh, there was a long list of things that people were presented with, and we asked them to um, to rate their, their top five. Um, so uh, there's some differences in what people see as their top five priorities and things that are uh, challenging and ripe for innovation. So you see um, at the where library directors are currently focused is around uh, data curation and research data management and indeed talking to Canadian colleagues 
I can see why this gets um, a lot of attention. 75% of people uh, put this put this in their in their top five. Um, but on the most challenging and ripe for innovation, you see 63% of people uh, signaling um, their uh, their interest in focusing on support for digital scholarship and digital humanities. Um, and then a, a, a drop off from there to um, open access uh, publishing, research information management, uh, data curation, and IR activities. And I'll, and I'll just add, so the, the group that was looking at the strategic plan for Carl found this particular slide most compelling. Um, and in some ways, it's not surprising. So as, as Marilee was suggesting, RDM is top of mind in Canada. The amount of, of resources and, and people power and money that we have invested uh, in the Portage network is really quite extraordinary. And, and as a result, um, the, the work of Portage and Carl has, has achieved a huge amount of prominence in the country. So it, it's not surprising that it's our number one thing. It's almost surprising that there were 25% who didn't put it in the top five. Um, and I think facilities and budget just never go away. So it would be hard to imagine a, a slate of five of priorities that didn't include money and facilities. Um, but I think in some ways the focus on digital humanities, digital scholarship, and the focus on RIM were, were uh, quite interesting to us. They, they hadn't always surfaced as, as clearly in our conversations. So, but there's certainly areas that many of us are starting to move into in those spaces uh, at Carl, and we're focusing on new roles and new partnerships with our campus. But really, as Marilee was saying, that the, the issue around the, the second side, the right side of that screen, the challenging, the right for innovation, is what is in some ways the sweet spot for, for us. Um, those are the tough problems. Those are, those are the problems that we need help with, uh, the ones that innovation seems within our grasp, but we, we need some assistance to, to really to get there. And so again, it was really interesting that 63% of us framed out digital humanities and digital scholarship as an area that's ripe for innovation. It makes good sense. We're all, we're all moving in that direction. And it was great to see it called out. Um, and open access and, and um, research information management. It, it made good sense and it was very affirming to see it um, listed. Um, another thing that we, we asked uh, people in their own words, so this was not people uh, uh, choosing from a text box but expressing themselves in, in uh, text was to uh, talk about the most significant initiatives that they would be undertaking on their campuses in the next two years. Uh, so we had um, 19 people who, uh, who gave us information in this category and then we coded uh, the information. So again, kind of uh, confirming um, some of the things that were challenging and ripe for innovation. We see people uh, investing in digital scholarship and digital humanities um, also, shared systems, um, research data management, uh, skills development, and facilities and renovation. But as those of you who've done surveys know, it can be kind of, um, well, taken surveys and, uh, and uh, analyzed surveys, it can be kind of tedious to code out this information. So um, present this information for what it's worth. But I think it's um, many of uh, Colleagues that would have been answering this survey from Ontario, they would be they would be thinking very clearly around the Collaborative Futures project that is just taking over um, um, a large proportion of Carl Library uh, in the province of Ontario, moving into a shared library information system. Um, so again, these were not surprising, uh, but it's useful to see them listed in that in that order. Yeah. Um, so. This is this was for those of you who took the survey. Thank you very much. This was a it was a relatively short survey. Uh, so we have gone through I think kind of the major findings from the Canadian part of the survey, and we do want to share with you some interesting highlights from uh, both the uh, kind of compare and contrast some data from the UK survey and the um, Australia New Zealand survey. But we thought that this would be a good time to pause and uh, see if there's questions or any discussion around um, the Canadian uh, perspective, since that's an important one and why we wrote our proposal <laughs> to, to come and share, uh, share with you here today. So 
any uh, thoughts or perspectives on data that we've shared with you so far? So we can come back to, to any of this, but um, let's, uh, let's, let's move um, forward and look at some of the um, other uh, areas. So um, in the same time period that we did the Canadian survey in conjunction with CALL, um, we did a survey for um, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we see, as um, Vivian foreshadowed, uh, a sort of a different um, array of things that are both in the uh, top priorities and uh, most challenging, right, for innovation. Um, so here you see that the uh, folks in Australia and New Zealand also are um, interested in support for digital scholarship, digital humanities, but at the very top of their uh, most challenging right for innovation is being able to uh, better tell the story of libraries to be able to reflect that back to um, to funders um, and other stakeholders. And they wind up getting, what is that, seven things into their yeah. top five because they're just uh, so split on so many other things. So library skills development and visibility of the library's collections are both at 33% well, uh, that third position gets split between three different things, 29% for um, uh, e-collections, uh, open access uh, concerns, education and support for open access, and uh, research data management. Um, and then when we go to the UK, we see uh, kind of a, a different array of things. Now, there were some small changes in the survey instrument, both because we learned things along the way and also in discussions with um, Carl and Call, uh, there were some small changes to the, um, to the survey instrument themselves itself. But one of the things that we, um, that's probably the biggest change in the survey is that we gave people five choices, so uh, top five. In, when we ran the European version of the survey, it was a top three. So we, we asked people to make harder choices um, in, in some ways. So uh, that's going to um, impact um, what you see. But at the top of their list is research data management. Um, uh, they have, you know, that's an area where they really still need to uh, come together and have more of a unified approach. Whereas in, in, in Canada, I think that the fact that there is um, a national and consolidated effort kind of takes it off the list of, um, of most challenging and ripe for innovation. Um, so yeah, and, and to be honest, we're, we're, we're really at the beginning stages of trying to analyze the relationship between all of these, and I literally was just trying to map it out this morning um, in my hotel room, so it's um, still a little bit hot off the press, but you know, there, there are certain things that, that appear unique to Canada and there's certain things that are the same across all three and I and you know I'm not sure even which piece is the most compelling but when I look at the the top priorities of all three jurisdictions I see that research data management makes all three lists and so I think that tells us something about the importance of that across the world and also value to funders it makes all three lists um, but there are certain things that are just not in the Canadian view so the whole area around, there just isn't a priority around licensed electronic content. And there isn't a priority around increasing the visibility of our collections. They're just not front of mind as priorities in Canada. And the one area that's unique in our priorities for right now is digital humanities, digital scholarship, regardless of the definition. But again, when we focus on the challenging and the innovative, which is again the sweet spot, uh, what I see, there's one area that is the same, that is considered um, innovative and ripe uh, for change across all three areas, and that's digital scholarship, digital humanities, which I think is really interesting because it's a bit of a surprise. Um, and there are many things that are not in the Canadian view, that never made it into the Canadian list at all, that are prominent in Australia and the UK. And those are demonstrating value. Uh, it, it doesn't feel like that's something either that we can do, that it's right for innovation, or it, it just doesn't feel like it's there. Or something like uh, developing librarian skills. You know, a, a positive take on that might be that we feel in Canada that we, we've already got a pretty good handle on that. 
or that it's just not right for innovation, so we don't want to invest our resources there. Or licensed electronic content. It's not on our mind because we actually feel that we've got a pretty good handle on it. Again, that might be uh, a false uh, assumption, and that's the part that I think we'll need to struggle with as we're looking at the data more. Uh, what, what is the reason for the absence? What is the reason for the presence? Um, and finally, looking at what's challenging and ripe for innovation that's unique to Canada. Research information management made our list, and it didn't make the list of other two jurisdictions. And Dale, the institutional repository, made Canada's list and, and didn't <laughs> make the others. So I leave that to you, and I, I really, we'd love to hear what you think of, of those absences or presences. Uh, just a couple of comments from traveling all over these places. You know, I think one of the things is that the government mandates uh, affect the responses here a little bit. You know, research assessment exercises in, yeah. in Australia yeah. and UK obviously lead to the funding of the institutions at a very top slice level. Yeah. That's important. The other thing is in Australia, uh, there's, a, there's a big push on uh, connecting to student engagement that is like government mandated as well. So there's a lot more going into that space of the value of the library or having the, the resources they need in order to, to, to uh, make student engagement higher. The second comment I'd make is that I found interesting is in all of the discussions that we've had the last couple of days, it seems to me that skills, developing skills, that are going to be required to actually do creative things in the digital humanities and digital scholarship is a huge problem for for not just libraries, but, but just for the universities writ large. And I feel like that is something that's probably maybe understated mm -hmm. because uh, it's not that it's necessarily library. Obviously, library skills have to grow, but just the skill sets required to do what people want to do in these top priorities are not always there right now, so how are they going to grow that? Yeah, I think it's an excellent point, and the, the interesting piece is that there's a lot of work going on in Canada in that area right now, and so um, we're working right now on a new revised slate of competencies uh, for librarians, and it covers the whole the whole category, including the competencies to, to succeed in with uh, digital curation and, and some of these other um, pieces that we're seeing across the slate. But for one reason or another, our Canadian um, uh, directors in responding to this survey didn't call out uh, the workforce. As the chair of strengthening capacity, I like to think that because we're doing such an amazing job, no more work needs to be done, but I know that's not true. <laughs> Um, I, I, I just think that there were so many things vying for our director's attention that when they were only allowed to choose five, they had all sorts of nuts and bolts, hard ticket items, uh, and they ran out of slot before they got to workforce. Um, but we'll never know. I also seem to recall that the end for, for Canada was 19, right? For some of it. For um, some of it. That was for the, so the end, I think, overall was, um, let's see, we can go back up. Uh, no, that's fine. That's what we're here for. Um, uh, 24. 24. Yeah, yeah. Out of the 29. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Or I'm not sure that it went to the two federal. I'd have to check that. That's a good question. Oh, Donna? Yes. Uh, it's striking me that the the interests reflect the size of the uh, each of the four committees. <laughs> so people were very consistent in terms of their interests. It's interest. okay. they, they self select which of the four committees they're on, and obviously they're reflecting those interests. Yeah, so um, Donna's comment, in case it's not being picked up by the mic, uh, I think was a very astute one, and it actually reflects in some ways the four committee structure uh, of Carl. The interesting piece is when I was reflecting on these results this morning, um, I saw that many of our priorities map into the um, advancing research portfolio. They really are, are, are pushing there. And that, I think, in some ways calls out, as you're suggesting, the intense interest in, in that part of our work. Um, and it's not because the other components aren't, aren't important. It's, I just think we had forced people to only choose five things, and they had so many things they cared about um, that they ran out of slots. 
<laughs> so um, I'm wondering um, if you, so you asked kind of related questions here, right? The, the priorities um, that are your current priorities and the things that you It was the same list, priorities. yeah. And we right. asked people, what are your top five in each category? Yeah, yeah. and I wonder if you, uh, for the, the second set, the most challenging mm -hmm. right, innovation, you actually saw more divergence there across country. And if so, my hypothesis is actually that the phrase right for innovation might be introducing some ambiguity. Um, because I've been sitting here puzzling uh, about that slash and thinking, are they supposed to be synonyms? And because right for innovation to me is not the same thing as most challenging. And I'm actually sitting, sitting here thinking, what does right for innovation even mean? Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, is it, is it low hanging fruit um, or is it, um, uh, you know, there's an obvious need or what? And so I actually wonder, especially across, you know, varieties of English, whether there's real potential here for, for different results, say, in Australia. Yeah, again, in case it's not picked up by the mic, the comment was around the slash, the most challenging slash right for innovation. Are we actually asking our respondents to do two things in one question, yeah. which can be confusing? And so were they answering on the basis of most challenging, or were they answering on the basis of right for innovation? And it could be slightly different results. And I think again in the survey instrument, I think that there was a um, there was a you know sentence or two that went along with this. Um, but what we're really after is where is there opportunity for collective um, for collective action. So that's how. Yeah. So that that's a way to to think about framing it. And I think that that's why you get things like facilities issues not exactly up yeah. for kind of collective action. Sure, the options for collective action necessarily aren't the most challenging things. And, you know, things yeah, yeah, you know, right, things. right, right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I think challenging kind of works against low-hanging fruit. Yeah. I also wondered at one point, again, after the survey is done, you always have these pondering. Uh, moment of wisdom. The moment of wisdom of clarity. Yeah. The five-year window, um, you know, five years didn't feel that it was very far out. And, and so in some cases, I think we responded saying that, well, we think there'll be change, but the change will be relatively modest. What if we had said 10 years uh, or, 30. or 30, but we only said five? Um, so things don't change all that rapidly in some areas of our enterprise. I don't know whether that had an impact on, on how people responded. <laughs> but I think you still see some pretty, I mean, if you go back to that, um, to the student data, for example, um, you do see some pretty radical, people think in five years that, you know, that Libraries Technology Center is going to be something that we're going to be living and breathing and making a really big transformation mm -hmm. um, in, in, in some way to, to get to that. If that's what we're anticipating in five years, that's a, that's a big shift. And, but we also saw um, the expectation of more change with our, with our students than we did with our faculty. The sense that faculty behaviors don't change that rapidly, but student behaviors change dramatically because it's a whole new group that comes in every year. So, yeah. Um, speaking of students, we had, uh, I think, two more slides that we wanted to, to share, I just remembered. <laughs> um, so, uh, so remember when I said um, with, uh, with students, it was interesting to look also uh, comparatively at the um, UK data and also the Australian New Zealand data, uh, because I think you see some uh, similar patterns um, in, in some ways. So uh, what, where, did, uh, where did the UK respondents, our library directors, see um, uh, students in the future? It's library as technology center, and also even more strongly than in um, uh, than in uh, Canada, uh, a big jump in receiving uh, research support services, and then in Australia, New Zealand, again, huge jump in library as technology center, and an even bigger jump in in, uh, in students receiving research support services. Um, so I thought that these two were kind of um, some trends to, to pull out is, you know, what are we expecting the library to be uh, doing and how is the library going to be appearing to, um, to students and this kind of anticipation, un completely unexpected to me, um, anticipation of uh, undergraduates receiving um, research support services was something that I thought I would 
flag because it's really not a lot that I hear talked about at library conferences. So, so in in library conferences, you know, five years ago it was all about um, uh, I don't know linked data. Three years ago it was all about Bitcoin. Five years from now it's all going to be about research support services for for undergraduates. So, any thoughts or reactions to uh, either? Library as Technology Center or Research Support Services for students? Yeah, Pascal. So I think this is quite exciting because it means we have a common platform across uh, Australia, the UK, and Canada to really look at these areas and try to come up with uh, common solutions or at least compare what we do in these areas with each other. Dale, you had a comment? Uh, I'm just wondering if there's a definition problem again now where what people think when they when they see research support services by different different heads, or if it's just an abiding concern, like you need to be doing something about research support services and the population was sort of incidental, like, oh yes, everyone needs these things. Because I would question those future conference panels in five years <laughs> about research support services for undergraduates. Really? At scale? Across the curriculum? Mm -hmm. Huh. Okay, what will that look like? Because I don't, I don't I, I'd rather go blind there. If we mean it the same way we mean it for faculty, mm -hmm. research support services. And whatever people were thinking it meant, they think there's going to be a lot more of it five years from now. That's yeah. the thing. You know, the, yeah. the, in whatever some ways, it is. <laughs> whatever it is, right, there's going to be more. <laughs> I think I can comment kind of quickly on that from a, from our perspective at Virginia Tech. But we are working an awful lot around research services with undergraduates, and it's really kind of a mandate out of the university. So our focus of late really has been around uh, data science, <coughs> data analytics, use of data creation, data curation of data. Uh, there's a course coming out called Data Matters. We co-developed it with the faculty. There's an interdisciplinary group on campus called Data and Decisions faculty from all the colleges participate. We're a part of that as well, so we co-produce that and co-teach it now. So we, we can incorporate a lot of this data aspects in our first year experience program. Even. So we're seeing, for us, we're seeing this huge trend around that. And mm -hmm. We're focusing on the data because we, we have a good sized data services department. We're just leveraging our, our current strength. So Tyler's got the future. There you go. So talk to Tyler. <laughs> we'll see you on a panel oh, about the future. And the Li Libraries Technology Center. It was interesting when we um, when we got these um, these results from the UK. We did some uh, we did some interviews, some targeted interviews with library directors in the UK, and we asked them about this in particular um, Libraries Technology Center. And the people that we interviewed, I think we interviewed six library directors. And they all said, well, I'm not even sure what that term means. So then that made us really, uh, when we were do when we redid the survey with Carl and Carl, we paid particular attention to the definition and the words that went along with this um, so that we wouldn't run into that confusion. So we wouldn't have library directors say, I'm not sure what that meant. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's not my priority. So, you know, it could have been just the six people that we talked to. They said, well, that's not something, I'm not even sure what that term means, and it wouldn't be one of my priorities. So we paid particular attention to the definition of that, and it still came out um, quite quite high in, um, in the subsequent surveys that we did, both, both with, uh, with Canada, with uh, Carl and Call. Um, so. Interesting point. Okay, so research support services for students, a blip or not? We'll we'll find out. Come meet me meet me in St. Louis in, uh, in five years and let's let's find out. Um, other comments on this part of the survey? We can go into wrap up mode. Um, so so what does this uh, say to OCLC research? So we were kind of um, our European colleagues threw down the gauntlet and said you need to pay attention to other parts of the world. It's not just about the U.S. and U.S. Junior. Um, we we need to think about uh, our work and the context and the and the context of our work um, differently. Um, the good news is that uh, looking at so for the UK research data management was a particular high focus, and indeed we are we have done just a ton of work um, in research data management. We have a 
a publication survey series, and we also did a series of webinars that were based on the publications um, and also came up with a learning guide. So if you're not in Canada where everything's all you know, together and wonderful with, with RDM, um, that is a resource that's, that's out there and available for you. Um, similarly, research information management, which is uh, something that is, uh, as, as Bruce indicated, um, kind of, 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 of high concern and driven by national level interests in the UK and Australia, but is kind of in ascendance, I think, in other parts of the world. We have similarly done um, a great deal of work in uh, research information management, looking at uh, CRIS systems and looking at the range of stakeholders that includes the library um, and how libraries uh, can and, and should be involving themselves in research uh, information management systems. And um, indeed, my colleague Rebecca Bryant is at this conference and has done uh, a great bit of work um, in this area, and she's a, a, just an amazing um, resource. And then with open access, which is really something that um, I think that uh, OCLC's uh, work and investments were um, diffuse, maybe, to say the least. Uh, we, were, um, we were rather encouraged to uh, launch by that uh, European survey that we did uh, to um, launch a open access and open content survey, so looking not just at um, kind of capital A, capital, capital O, capital A open access, but also looking at the range of open content, uh, including digitized materials that, um, that uh, libraries uh, uh, provide and make available. Um, we did a major survey. I think we got 780 responses from 78 countries or something like that. So it was a very broad survey, and we're um, doing the analysis on that, and publication will be available on that later. And I think that that, that really shows how libraries are um, investing and thinking about challenges uh, related to a broad range of topics around open access and open content. So um, maybe I'll put that on the proposal list for the next CNI to talk about results about that survey. Um, so, and these are mostly just uh, takeaways, kind of some short URLs for um, our work in RDM, um, RIM, uh, and uh, a little bit on the open on the open content survey. Uh, but that's um, that's it. So, on this particular survey, uh, we are. Uh, really wrapping up the preliminary results in the, um, and sharing them at conferences like this. And you can look for a publication of the combined results from the um, Canadian survey along with uh, colleagues from, uh, along with the UK and call data later on this year. So have that to look forward to. But um, we're happy to take any more questions or uh, or talk to you all in the hallways and on the emails. So thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you.